Hey, I'm Derek, it's me, Derek, and welcome to Stop Skeletons and Fighting. In 2020, it was estimated that Apple is the third largest video game company in the world, well above Nintendo and rubbing elbows with Sony and Microsoft, which is weird because Apple doesn't make games, but they own the App Store. And hey, turns out people really like to game on their phones. The vast majority of App Store purchases are games. There is a lot of money to be made. So much that, well, Epic is currently forcing the industry to air out all kinds of dirty laundry in court. But we should remember, Apple wasn't the first. No, the first device to really attempt to bring together video games and cell phones was, oh my gosh, oh, in the middle of filming, I'm, so, I'm sorry, everybody. Hello? The Nokia N-Gage. The Nokia N-Gage. And friends, let me tell you, the tale of how it all went wrong is a fascinating one. Because the N-Gage was the embodiment of ambition. It had a full 3D Tony Hawk, its own Elder Scrolls game, a John Romero FPS, and futuristic tech that would become the standard like leaderboards, wireless multiplayer, internet capabilities, rev it up with MP3s, whatever the hell that means. All wrapped up in a little taco that fits in your pocket. It was released to compete against the GBA, and it was an extremely worthy competitor. And a monumental failure. So what uh, hop on? Oh wait, that's not my show. Welcome back to Past Mortem, where we break down and explore the stories of video games. And it's time to talk about the little device that saw the future, but just could never deliver it. The Nokia N-Gage. You might be surprised to learn that Nokia as a company is over 150 years old, beginning life as a humble wood pulp company in what is now Finland, but what was then the Russian Empire. Founded in 1865, Nokia was a player in the wood processing business for over 35 years, before expanding into electricity in the early 1900s. From there, Nokia spent the next century gobbling up various companies and dipping their fingers into random industries. They didn't start making phones until the 1980s, starting with the Mobira Senator and iterating from there. And yes, that is Gorbachev doing important politics on one of Nokia's earliest phones. You don't run an Eastern European company for over a century without learning to play both sides. After a major internal shakeup in the early 1990s, a devastating Finnish recession, and you know, the whole collapse of the Soviet Union, Nokia switched directions and went all in on the cellular market. Here's the thing about Nokia, they had a long history of being a bit of a shape-shifting company, never afraid to take risks and innovate. And with their focus now on cell phones, they set to work and soon found themselves leading the pack. They designed fashionable phones with wider varieties of styles and colors, as well as scheming up luxury models for the disposable income crowd. If you are my age, either this or this was probably your first cell phone, as they are not just some of the best-selling cell phones, but best-selling devices in the history of electronics. By the year 2000, Nokia was a $30 billion company. Roughly one-third of all the world's cell phones were Nokia cell phones. Their success came not just from the hardware side. Having the hottest phones on the market also meant innovating on the software running them. And as both the hardware and software of cell phones evolved, there was more potential for video games. Beginning in 1997, you began to see Snake pre-installed onto Nokia's latest devices. Oh, your first phone game was Angry Birds? Mine was Snake. This is my generation's Pong. Primitive block and dot games were basically all phones could handle in terms of gaming at the time. But remember, this was when cell phones were built for phone calls first and foremost. However, technology evolved and Nokia phones would eventually be some of the earliest to support Java, moving games well past blocks and dots. And when some of those so-called J2ME games started catching on in big ways, your Bejeweled's, your Zuma's, Nokia took notice of a new emerging revenue stream. There was money to be made selling games on phones. Of course, portable gaming had been big business for years. I mean, look at Nintendo. The Game Boy was the top dog for most of the 90s, despite competition from a slew of technically more advanced rivals. The Atari Lynx and the Game Gear, the Wonderswan and the Neo Geo Pocket, but these were all just flashes in the pan compared to the unbreakable Brick Boy, which I feel I need to remind people went almost a decade without a meaningful hardware upgrade. We can thank Pokemon for that. But while the Game Boy was making baby steps, portable technology was going through a boom. Of course, we've got Nokia's wild success with cell phones, but there was also Walkmans, portable CD players, PDAs, and of course, the TI-83 graphing calculator the Game Boy your teacher can't take away from you. But then I'm also carrying a wallet and keys on top of that, 
A fresh pair of Jinko jeans can only contain so much, people. Clearly, the forthcoming millennium would be all about the battle of consolidating those gadgets into a single device. And let's be real, the gaming component would probably be the toughest part to nail. And Nokia knew that. Before directly competing with Pokemon and the just-released GBA, they first came to Nintendo for an alleged partnership. If you can't beat them, join them, right? The story goes that in the early 2000s, when the DS was still an early R&D, Nokia pitched a Nintendo phone, a device to combine Nintendo's gaming hardware with Nokia's cellular tech. The concept apparently spent some time in R&D and was officially pitched to the board of directors, where it was then rejected. Because of course it was! Or, as the rumor goes, this of course has never been confirmed publicly by either party. But you know, it's hard to believe that Nokia and Nintendo didn't at least talk before the engage. But what we do know is that Nokia was a company that built itself on risk and innovation. There was money to be made in video games, and they were going to get a piece of the action. In November 2002, Nokia announced their entry into the video game market with the Engage Game Deck at their annual mobile internet conference event. As explained by company spokesman Keith Nowak, Snake debuted in 1997. Then we went to downloading games onto a cell phone, then downloading even more levels for those games. This is part of that evolution. Though there wasn't much in the way of system specs at this point, Nokia went ahead and promised that their upcoming handheld would boast gameplay richer than the Game Boy Advance, held on swappable multimedia cards, and working relations with some of the biggest publishers in the industry. Oh yeah, and it was also a cell phone. But they came out swinging, in addition to serving up multiplayer over Bluetooth and online connections, which I'll remind you was still revolutionary for the time, there was also a whole suite of other promised online features. Downloadable strategy guides, cheat codes, leaderboards, even the ability to record and share game clips with other users. In 2002, features years ahead of their time, all wrapped up in a cell phone design that fit easily in your pocket. Of course, promising the moon before you even unveil the damn thing is usually not the smartest idea, but at the time, Nokia was one of the few companies that could actually pull this off. So Nokia had officially tossed its hat in the ring, but talk is cheap. They needed to show that they could back it up. And there was no better place than E3 2003. For Engage's big public debut, Nokia went all out with a big budget space on the show floor and an onstage presentation on May 13th. And by all accounts, they, they well, uh, and they say you never get a second chance to make a first impression? The showcase opened with everyone's favorite game staple, an awkward song and dance number, complete with what has been described as the N-Gage rap. Please believe me when I tell you, we looked all over for any footage of this cursed performance. There are pictures and brief B-roll snippets, but near as I can tell, there is no surviving footage of the cursed N-Gage rap. So I prepared for you all a dramatic reenactment. My name is Derek and I'm here to the comedy of errors only continued over the course of the next hour, with numerous technical and audio snafus and lackluster game demos with frame rates in the single digits. At some point, a short-haired John Romero of Doom and Daikatana fame sauntered onto stage and showed off his port of Red Faction. Eurogamer described Romero's presentation as, quote, one of the longest periods of silence in gaming history. Again, we can only pray that one day video surfaces. But that still wasn't the worst of it. This is 2003. It ain't over until the booth babes show up. To cap off the show, a lady holding a skateboard walked onto stage and began dancing. She then removed her shirt to reveal her bikini top and the N-Gage's price painted on her stomach. The N-Gage would launch in the fall at a whopping $299, with games going for 30 to 40 bucks a pop. It was reported that there was, quote, no applause. Now compare that to the Game Boy Advance's launch price of $100, with games topping out at around $30. The price was called Suicidal, a number so ridiculous that it immediately doomed the entire platform. Not even Turk from Scrubs could save it! But his video game moment was still to come. But I can see what Nokia was thinking here. I mean, many phones of the time were priced roughly around $300 to $400. And when pressed on the price, Nokia's head of entertainment and media, Ilka Reiskinen, said that at that price, you're basically getting a brand new cell phone with a game console as a bonus. And by that metric, yeah, it was a bargain, since they could also play, um, check my notes here, Red Faction. But it created a question for the end gaze that would forever haunt it. Was it a cell phone that played games, or a game system with a cell phone? And somehow the ice cold reaction to the unveiling still wasn't the worst thing to happen to the N-Gage. On the same day, Sony, the masters of the E3 upset, announced that they too were entering the handheld market with the PlayStation Portable. PSP, yes, PlayStation Portable. 
It's simple. <laughs> this was such a big deal that they didn't even show anything, but it stole the show. Kudaragi stood in front of a PowerPoint slide, held up a UMD, and that's all it took. It didn't hurt that the hardware specs they planned for it ate Nokia's lunch. I mean, sure the N-Gage could compete with the GBA, but the PSP was on a whole different level. Super impressive 3D graphics, movie playback, its own wireless multiplayer service. All it seemed to lack in comparison was the cell phone functionality, which outside of releasing much earlier than the PSP, was really the only thing the N-Gage had over the competition. Except, well, that had its own set of issues. So here it is, the N-Gage. It's, uh, it's pretty big. It's light. I actually think it's pretty comfortable, even if it looks like a little Chaco Taco. At a glance, man, I don't know. It's pretty neat. But the second you start using the thing, problems immediately show up. For example, to make calls on an N-Gage, you have to not hold it flat against your face uh, like this, but like this. Because the speaker, the earpiece, is actually up here, and thus, the legend of the side talk was born, complete with websites dedicated entirely to photos of people getting their side talking on. That's right, the N-Gage was one of the first internet memes. This is the actual lasting legacy of the N-Gage. If you knew anything about the N-Gage, it was probably this. And if you've never heard of the N-Gage, this tells you enough. Hello, hello. They hung up. Actually, the other legendary thing about the N-Gage is that the design was allegedly inspired by Goatsy, which, I mean, I mean, who knows? Who knows if that's actually true? But there are more important things. Easy. There are more important things to discuss. We, we, we have to move on. The facts were the N-Gage was incompetently designed, which is baffling. Nokia, you make cell phones. This is a bad design for a cell phone. Maybe the reason the speaker was on the side was that this tiny device literally didn't have any room anywhere else. Looking at the screen size in particular, it's pretty obvious this was designed from scratch. It was a Frankenstein's monster from other cell phone designs. This screen is fine for a phone, but for gaming, it sits with the Dreamcast VMU and the Pokemon Mini. Not really something to play full 3D games on. The best example of this is, without a doubt, Sonic N, which has a letterbox option just to make the game fully playable. Like, look at this! It is approximately one and a half by one inch. This isn't so much a red flag that your device has problems, so much as one with flashing lights and a bullhorn. It is one of the most ridiculous things I have ever seen. The D-pad isn't great, and using the number pad as buttons it gets the job done, but doesn't allow for much precision because their primary use was for dialing phone numbers. And there isn't even a button that launches you directly into games, but there's an FM radio button, even for 03. What? Even the swappable multimedia cart idea seems to come from Nokia's cell phone centric brain. They'd have you believe this is a gaming device, yet to swap out games, you must remove the backplate, remove the battery, and slide in the cart there. Sure, this Tony Hawk looked better than the GBA versions, and let's actually take a second to admire that. All problems aside, I'm impressed this game runs and plays as well as it does. But to then have to do all of this just to swap from a GBA Sonic port to a PS1 Tony Hawk port was a kickflip too far. When Nokia announced their plans to enter the video game market, the GBA was their only competition. But by the time they officially unveiled the N-Gage, the GBA's improved upgraded model, the SP, had dropped, and Sony had officially entered the chat. At this point, Nintendo had been undefeated in the portable market, and Sony was riding high off the success of a system that was well on its way to becoming the single best-selling console in history. Yes, N-Gage was the only system with cell phone tech but it was still going to be a monumental task to square up against the competition. Undeterred, Nokia spent the months leading up to the N-Gage's release, locking down more publishers and trying to generate as many headlines as possible. In one ill-advised example, Ilka Raiskinen took shots at the GBA, writing their competitor off as a system for 10-year-olds. Nintendo, in response, would describe themselves as unthreatened by Nokia's upcoming entry into the market. Never forget the motto, Nintendo makes games, does not play games. In any event, the last couple of months leading up to the launch saw games news sites gearing up for Engage coverage, adding Engage categories and sections to their sites, sharing all of Nokia's press releases, and hyping up their early impressions of the hardware. Sure, it was a rocky dismount at E3, but the gaming press was ready to treat it like a real competitor. They were given as fair a chance as anyone else. October 7th, 2003, the Engage launched. And, well, how to do? Of course, there were day one events and people lining up outside of stores, but in reality, it was not just bad, but 
far worse than anyone had predicted. First week sales in North America apparently totaled 5,000 units, with sales in the UK reported as low as just 500 units. Now, for comparison, a year and a half earlier, the GBA sold 540,000 units in just its first week on US shelves. Maybe not the fairest comparison, but it's still a factor of 100 to 1. Part of the Engage's problem was a matter of accessibility. Nokia was a cell phone company at heart, and on the tech side of things, the Engage was definitely phone first, game system second, which meant buying a system also meant getting yourself signed up with a cellular service plan, a process which, fun fact, sucked back then too. Because of this, Engages were primarily sold by phone retailers. They were available at game stores, but if you bought an Engage out of EV games, you still need to bring it elsewhere to activate the cell phone portion to then play the games. Even to get our N-Gage up and running, today we had to trot over to eBay and buy a dummy SIM card. Apparently systems were sold with 30-day prepaid cards, but there was still a monthly service plan after that. It was a huge extra step between Nokia and the gamers they were trying to court from Nintendo and Sony. What people wanted was a game system that was a cell phone, but instead what they got was a cell phone that played games. Which ironically is what we have now, but it was, it was 2003. And let's take a quick look at the games. Eight games were released within the first few days of the system, and let's break them down real fast. Sonic N, Super Monkey Ball Jr., and Puyo Pop were all GBA ports. Tony Hawk, Tomb Raider, and Pandemonium were all PS1 ports. This version of Puzzle Bobble is terrible, legitimately one of the worst games I've ever played. And Space Impact Evolution X, which was a pack-in game, was just a sequel to Nokia's fine, I guess, shooter that was already on a bunch of their devices. And this is just my take. The few reviews at the time weren't much better. If you really cared about games at the time, there was nothing here for you. I mean, it was neat having PS1 ports in your pocket. Tony Hawk is shockingly really good, and it's still really impressive to see the first Tomb Raider running on this thing. But these games were four and seven years old at this point. And despite advertising online gaming via cellular service, it wasn't available at launch. And when it was added, it suffered from incredible latencies of up to 10 seconds. Suddenly a Game Boy Link cable doesn't sound so bad. Was it really a surprise? No one was rushing out to buy these things? The response by Nokia was swift. By the second week of availability, the price for the Engage was slashed by $100 at GameStop and EB Games locations in North America. Hope it was a well-paying gig for that bikini babe because she took her shirt off for basically nothing. If you resided in the UK though, you might have managed an even better bargain at mobile providers. You can get your hands on an Engage for as little as one penny with a more costly service plan to pair, obviously. But you can't make moves like that without people noticing. The public began perceiving Nokia as extremely desperate. And to be clear, they were. Within the company, the goal was to move between 6 million and 9 million N-gauges by the end of 2004, one year after launch. With division director Lauren Schuster claiming that represents the critical mass required for the business to become a successful platform. Now, seeing as Nokia managed to sell through 150 million of their standard phones in the previous year in 2002, these N-gauge predictions sounded pretty reasonable. But between those poor launch sales, the number of GBAs already in the wild, and the public knowing that new handhelds would soon be on the way? Oh yeah, Sony announced the PSP that summer, but in November, just one month after the N-Gage dropped, Nintendo announced what would be the DS. That 6 to 9 million goal was looking more and more unrealistic. On the public side, Nokia tried some clever spin, bragging that over 400,000 units were sold to retailers, which is clever business speak for moving 400k from warehouses, but says nothing about how many moved into customer hands. And even that 400k number was in contention. Regardless of whatever numbers they were throwing around, the facts were that the likes of GameStop were already working to rid themselves of their stock, removing as many as a third of their locations from the Engage supply chain. In terms of software sales, for its October launch, Tomb Raider became the system's top seller with only 2,960 copies. Other titles were even more dire. THQ's MLB Slam only sold 153 copies. Your cousin's mixtape sold more than that. And that was in spite of Nokia's own distribution shortcomings. Apparently, the selection of Engage games actually at a given retailer was a total crapshoot. Even with its limited library, no one location would ever have the whole selection. Not many people wanted their games, and those who did couldn't reliably get them. If there were any diehard Engage fans, they were more likely to get their hands on games in a different way. Piracy. 
Within just a month of the system launch, hackers already managed to crack Nokia's game encryption and started putting all of them up for download online. Not only that, you wouldn't even need an N-Gage to play them. As it turns out, they would run on any of Nokia's Symbian OS phones. Remember when I said that these were not game systems with cell phones, these were cell phones that played games? Nokia talked some big talk and they really went for it, but pretty much immediately, the N-Gage was a full-on laughingstock to the point where websites were turning on it completely. N-Gage would close out the year with eight more games, 16 total, which isn't bad, but let's look at that lineup. Four sports games, the GBA port of Rayman 3, the GBA port of Splinter Cell, MotoGP, which is not a GBA port technically, but still another game available on the GBA, and the highlight probably being John Romero's Red Faction port, a fairly impressive port of the PS2 game. But honestly, nothing you couldn't get on the GBA. On the surface, these games are all actually fine, outside of the screen size, of course. They're all mostly playable. The bigger point here is, outside of a really solid port of a four-year-old Tony Hawk game, the N-Gage had almost nothing for people who cared about games. To use their own words against them, it's the game, stupid! By February 2004, just five months out, Nokia had no choice but to admit that they had fallen well short of their projections. Nokia chairman and CEO would confess that the sales are in the lower quartile of the bracket we had as our goal, which is CEO speak for YIKES! He gave the system a hard deadline to prove itself. November 2005, the system's two year anniversary. And this is what I love about this story. Nintendo, Virtual Boy flopped, shut it down. Sega, 32X flopped, shut it down. Nokia, the Engage flopped. Okay, Buster, you got 19 months to shape up, but that's it. Like, can you imagine a company so massively successful that when a product expected to move millions instead only moves thousands, you then give the team a year and a half to turn it around? If that doesn't tell you how huge Nokia was, I don't know what else to tell you. But they did have an ace up their sleeve, a new hardware revision that they had hoped might solve some of their troubles. Just in time for the end of Q104, Nokia finally went public with plans for a new and improved N-Gage, though rumors had already been kicking around for months. The upgraded system would be christened the QD, an abbreviation for the Latin quaque die, translating to every day. But let's just drink that in. Just imagine Nintendo announcing the SP six months after dropping the GBA. That's what the QD was. It has got to be one of the fastest redesigned turnarounds in history. The stated purpose of the update was to cut down on production cost, as well as fix some of the more evident design flaws of the original model, such as no longer requiring the removal of the system battery in order to swap games, or requiring it to be held sideways to use as a phone. Though it did not increase the screen size, though other notable changes include axing the pointless FM radio functionality and adding a handy button to launch players immediately into games. Funny what designers can come up with after the fact. This QD model was the real deal. It is a solid piece of hardware, and in total transparency, this is the model we've been playing. We were not able to get our original model N-Gage working. Trust me, it's dead. But playing on the QD, maybe this is why I kind of think these games are, they're all right? Trust me, I have played worse. Engage had another showing on E3, May 2004, with a heavy focus on the spiffy new QD model along with a batch of new games. And to be fair, while PSP and DS got their official unveiling, they were behind mega long lines. Hey, no waiting at the QD kiosks, but Nokia was still putting in the hours, making a solid effort to make this work. And if you were excited about the QD, there was good news. Well, if you lived in Europe, because they got the QD model later that month in May 2004. Canada and the US would have to wait a bit longer. In the meantime, N-Gage fans got uh, some bad news. In June, just a month out from E3, Nokia's chief strategy officer said during a Helsinki press event that they'd be cutting the promised 50 to 100 games before the end of the year down to just 40. The company quickly tried to backtrack and put out a press release claiming that he misspoke and that they were still planning on 50 games to be out for the holidays. Why they decided to make this announcement a few weeks before the QD dropped in North America is beyond me. When it did finally release in America in July, Nokia sweetened the deal with a $99 rebate and a free copy of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I mean, yeah, again, it's a solid port, but a solid port of a now five-year-old PS1 game. Ain't no one camping outside Best Buy for that. The QD was a much improved device, but the games simply weren't coming. By the end of 2004, they'd only managed to release, who wants to guess? Was it 50 games? 40 games? 
33 games in the entire year since the original N-Gage launched. That is Virtual Boy numbers. It was bad. And by the end of the year, the Nintendo DS and Sony PSP had both launched in select markets with the rest of the world following in 2005. Even if a region didn't yet have the DS or PSP, gamers would patiently wait until it did or just import it. But this is just the public facing side of things. As N-Gage's credibility publicly crumbled, things weren't going much better behind the scenes either. When Nokia disclosed their second quarter 2004 financial reports, they had to admit to shareholders a 5.7 drop in worldwide production sales. Of course, this wasn't the N-Gage's fault. At least not solely. I mean, Nokia was a multi-billion dollar company with a lot more going on than just the N-Gage. And the fact was that sales for Nokia's standard cellular devices had dropped since the previous year, owning largely two competitors releasing slick new phone designs. Once these reports went public, Nokia's stock took an immediate 16% dive on the Finnish stock exchange. This of course prompted swift, major changes within Nokia. Now, as far as the N-Gage goes, Nokia's multimedia division, which included the N-Gage business, was actually operating at only a minor loss compared to some other wings. The N-Gage wasn't the sole reason why Nokia was in trouble, but still, it was underperforming and heads were gonna roll. In early 2005, director of Nokia's game business program division, Ilka, Nintendo is not a threat, Raiskinen, was reassigned further away from the N-Gage. And there were rumors of production and R&D facilities shutting down. This prompted the UK's preeminent sales tracking service, ChartTrack, to stop publishing N-Gage data altogether, as they plainly laid out the fact that, quote, sales of the machine and its software have failed to make any impact on the market at all. An absolutely brutal truth, and one that Nokia themselves must have been all too aware of. Also in January, Nokia announced 1.3 million N-Gages had sold. A significant portion of those sales came from a release into the Asia-Pacific region, and yeah, 1.3 million, that's not nothing. But the DS just did half a million in its first week, and this was a far cry from 6 million, the minimum goal that had been set all the way back at launch in 2003. In the face of everything, Nokia said N-Gage wasn't going anywhere, and true to their word, they stayed competitive. Systems were slashed to $99. Oh, we gotta update the bikini, babe. There we go. And games went down in price too. N-Gage had another public showing at E3 2005 and would release 20 games in North America, making 2005 the system's most prolific year yet. But did it work? In an October press event held in Barcelona, they reassured the public of their continued commitment to the N-Gage system. But just one month later, on November 7th, 2005, the two-year deadline, Nokia finally gave it up. Having fallen short of every projection and failing to gain any real traction in the portable gaming market, the N-Gage game deck officially ceased production by the end of the year. Its last games to release would do so with limited distribution and fanfare over the course of the next several months. Trailers for these games exist, but most don't even bother to show gameplay or the system itself. In North America, 2006 saw the release of three games, the final being Warhammer 40k Glory in Death. Fitting. The final system library was 57 games in North America, 63 in PAL. Nokia admitted defeat and had formally bowed out of the handheld gaming market. But believe it or not, this wasn't quite the end of the N-Gage. At the end of the day, Nokia still saw that games could be a big business on their phones. With the collapse of the N-Gage, Nokia finally saw the light. Instead of trying to make a game system with a phone, they just brought the games to their phones. You know, the things that are some of the best-selling electronic devices in human history. The N-Gage branding was repurposed as an early digital distribution service where upcoming Nokia phones would come preloaded with the app to purchase and download games, sometimes called N-Gage 2.0. 2.0's public launch was in the spring of 2008, which came with a catch. This service wouldn't work on the actual N-Gage system because these new games would be too advanced for the older hardware to handle. Now, I can't imagine many people were still using N-Gages as their primary cell phones in 2008, but that's still a pretty solid cell phone. That's what I would call a solid cell phone cell phone. Hello, Burn Ward, can you prepare a gurney? Thank you. Nokia had moved on to newer and better phones, and N-Gage 2.0 was poised to be a killer feature. But when it finally launched, it only offered a grand total of six games, one of which was just a poker game. Ah, for Whoa. fuck's sakes, guys. But of course, Nokia never goes down without a fight, and they would attempt to fill out their lacking catalog. And you gotta give them respect. They somehow locked down exclusive entries in the Metal Gear and Resident Evil franchises, which... What? 
There's also an EDF game, apparently. Nearly 50 titles were released over the span of 18 months, but unfortunately, none of these games moved the needle. As a matter of fact, Nokia as a whole would enter into a decline around this time in the face of new competitors in the cellular market. Their business peaked in 2007, where they represented 40% of the mobile industry. And then that slice of the pie chart started rapidly shrinking. You know that gadget you're probably watching this on? Yeah, smartphones like the iPhone, which first launched in June 2007, or Android, which came out in 2008. Touchscreen smartphones dropped like a bomb and everything else quickly became obsolete. And that's not just hardware-wise. With these, two new major mobile operating systems came with their own dedicated digital storefronts with software offerings quickly putting Engage 2.0 to shame. Who needs your exclusive Resident Evil game, Nokia? I got Resident Evil 4 on my iPhone and it's just as good. Probably. Oh, and Resident Evil Degeneration did eventually come to iOS. Uh, you'll always have MGS Portable, I guess. In any case, Nokia discontinued Engage 2.0 in the fall of 2009, first shutting down their dedicated game development studio and later announcing the planned closure for the Engage storefront in September 2010. Though, thanks to the iPad dropping earlier that spring, it's likely few noticed. Though the Game Deck system had died years ago, this was the final nail in the coffin fork of the name. The shambling corpse of the Engage was finally put in the dirt in 2010. The Engage 2.0 was succeeded by a new service, Ovi. It was Nokia's attempt to match the broader offerings of Apple and Google's App Store. There was also an effort to port a portion of the Engage 2.0 game library, but by 2014, Ovi would be discontinued as well, where Nokia by that point had become a shadow of its former self. While the company managed to hold on to its market majority until around 2010, they underwent major changes after making a big deal with Microsoft in 2011 to manufacture and develop Windows phones. Later in 2013, Microsoft announced plans to acquire Nokia's mobile phone business as part of an initiative by CEO Steve Ballmer to re-envision Microsoft as a device and services distributor. But it wasn't too long after that they decided to just do away with the Nokia name entirely and to brand all their mobile interests under the broader Microsoft umbrella. Of course, there's a lot more to Nokia's existence since they remain a shape-shifting technology company, but much like the N-Gage, Nokia's mobile phones would go out not with a bang, but with a whimper. The N-Gage as a product and then a brand started as a competitor to the GBA and would find itself squaring up with just about every tech titan over its seven-year run. Nintendo, and then Sony 2, then Apple and Android before Microsoft gobbled the whole thing up. It's the Forrest Gump of failed early 2000s tech. Consumer electronics has many busts, but the Engage just refused to die despite never once actually being successful. That is the legacy that is important to me, and that is why I loved making this video. This video was just about the story, which was big enough that we needed to give the games their own space for their own video. That is coming, it's already in the can, it's coming very soon. It's already available on Patreon. A lot of people to thank for this video. Huge shout out to Cass, who was our lead researcher and writer for this project. Uh, big up to the Engage Discord, which that exists and they were awesome. They helped us out and gave us a lot of a. Uh, uh, a lot of assets and pictures and info with big thanks to Kelsey Lewin for helping us track down an original Engage and lending us a few games. Thanks to Adam McVeigh for assisting with the edit. And of course, huge shout out to all of our Patreon supporters who have been supporting us for six years now. We are almost at our 1,100 Patreon goal, which means it's about, it's about Zebo time. It's time for Resident Evil 4 on a damn Zebo. Get ready, all right? Support us if you can. If not, tell a friend. What's the dumbest, greatest YouTube channel well, lie and say it's ours, but just tell a friend about Stop Skeletons and Fighting. I am Uncle Derek, that is Producer Grace over there, and we can say thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again real soon. Stay powerful.